So what I start is I start with a list of, of phrases and words here. And I ask you, those of you who are under 40, tell me where are these words from. If you do that, I give you a $5 bill. <laughs> so the question is, where are these words coming from? You are not f under 40, OK? <laughs> <laughs> OK, nobody. I give you a hint. This is actually a list from a, a table of contents. Who said that? Oh, you are a professor. <laughs> anyway, Cyril gets my $5. <laughs> Some people actually read the literature, others imbibe the information. So the interesting thing about this list is that everybody in this room, at least 90% of us, could put ourselves and associate ourselves with one of those things there. I'm interested in habits, and I'm interested in memory, and so on, and everybody will fall under one of these rubrics. Now, this is an interesting thing, because if you look at it even more carefully, there is, in this entire two-volume, a thousand-page document, there is only about four pages about action, about movement. Everything is about inputs to the brain. And it's not by chance, because William James was educated in the background of the British empiricism, when the goal of the brain is to learn, to represent the world. And this is what the brains are, what the brains are, is to absorb the brain. So we can move to Europe from England, and then there is the gestalt psychology. That's the same exact thing. You don't have to do anything, just the information is coming into your brain. If you go to Pavlovian thinking, that's the same thing. All you have to do is give CS and US, and things will be associated. Movement, action is totally irrelevant. In fact, Pavlov uh, immobilized the, 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 the dogs and so on. So we will get back to this. So here's the, the next thing that, you know, we have a whole list of things that are, of course, very interesting because they are made up by people, not necessarily William James. William James just codified them. And then you had the words and the, 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 the task, and now we have to associate with things in the brain. And everybody knows phrenology, and that was a stupid thing. It was not reasonable whatsoever to associate bumps with memory and, and so on and so on. But that was back then. Today is different. So <laughs> what, what we do today is we associate those exact same words with different signals, such as uh, your, your favorite calcium signal, or unit firing, or the fMRI signal, and so on. So what you see here is the prefrontal cortex, which I had to make it large because I collected about 200 sing different words that have been associated with the prefrontal cortical function. I've got a similar list for hippocampal thyroid selection and a long list of, of the parietal cortex also. So the, the, again, the, the, there is a, a method, there is a philosophy that the brain is there to have an input, evaluate it, decide, and what comes after is not so important, but some output will actually occur. So this philosophy got not only into the psychology and cognitive science, but also in neuroscience. So this is the paradigm that most of us have been working on in for, for a very long time. You give a signal such as, oops, you give a signal, this is moving by itself, and you record from the brain and you look at the relationship between what's happening outside the brain and inside the brain, and you get a correlation. The problem with that is that the arbitrator is the experimenter. The, only the experimenter has exquisite access to the outside world and the firing of the neurons or the fMRI signal. The neurons inside the brain have no clue what they are seeing. They don't have a second opinion. They don't have what philosophy calls grounding. There is no way to understand the truth. So this is the typical situation that we are in. So you can ask, how is it possible 
that visual cortical neurons or any sensory neurons or any neuron in the brain actually will get educated by something else. And the only something else that exists is action. So this is another way of looking at the same picture is that, interestingly, in every single output, with every single output that goes out to the muscles, to the eyes, to the endocrine organs, uh, to, 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 the, to the heart, and so on, has a feedback loop from the output to the sensory system. This is called reaffrontation or coronary discharge and so on. So this is the second opinion that is capable of doing something for the brain. This is the grounding signal and so on. So what I mentioned that the, in a couple of slides ago, that what happened with William James is that we took that list seriously, took it to heart, and we naively assumed that those words and those boundaries actually exist. And these were the independent variables. And the goal of cognitive neuroscience is nothing else just to find mechanisms of those words with the same boundaries inside the brain. How naive this idea is. So I know that there are terms on the list that are negotiable, such as then you can think about, you know, let's say, habits. Are they negotiable? I think we could. How about memory? Maybe yes. How about emotions? How about uh, attention? And so on. But at least a couple of things on the list are seemingly non-negotiable. And this is perception of space and time. Perception of space and time are not negotiable because they are independent from each other and independent from everything else, at least according to Immanuel Kant and Newton and everything. So these are very important. So you can see time, space, and things. The next thing we know, and this, this audience is very much interested in this, that when we try to understand memory, then we have to bring this together. And indeed, episodic memory is by definition is what happened to me, where, and when. And this is a nice division of labor because it's not only the what that is stored at one place, but somewhere else, time, and somewhere else, the where, the space is, is, is encoded. And all you have to do is to multiply the marginals, and every single time, you can recall something. The problem is that it requires an axiomatic system where space and time actually exist. So if you look at how these concepts came about, then you may think about it, whether this is a universal thing or not so universal. If you look at various cultures, what their belief systems are, you can classify them into two, perhaps. One is that everything is stationary. Nothing is new under the sun. The, 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 the sun is wheeling around the earth every single day and so on. Everything is stationary. And if you are a believer in such a stationarity, your society can last for a long time. Ancient Egypt survived for three millennia. The, the case system in India is still the longest surviving society that existed. So this is an interesting thought that indeed, if you believe in no change, things go the same way, you, you are, nothing really happens. The other aspect of this thing is that no, 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 nothing is ever the same. Things are always moving around. So this is uh, two different insights. But it turns out there are still people who live with us in this, in this universe or in this, in this globe who have no concept about time whatsoever. These are the Amondava people in the Amazon and, uh, and the, the Aborigines in Australia. They understand arrangement, they understand order and sequence, but they have no clue, they don't understand time as it is independent from everything else. So what is the problem with this concept? The problem with this concept is that they are immeasurable. You cannot measure space, you cannot measure time. If you would like to measure it, then you have to convert them into something. So people, when science came in, they invented instruments. And once you have a rod, once you have a clock, you can measure the measurable aspects of, this, of these concepts, which is duration and distance. Now, if you have two different 
instruments that measure, they are very different instruments that measure these two different quantities, then they are probably different qualities, which is justifying why Newton and Immanuel Kant thought that these were the universal principles of everything that the human brain is trying to organize. But in fact, in every single language, many times these two concepts are used interchangeably. So, you know, we can ask, how far is the beach? And you say, hmm, you know, far is distance, but five minutes is time. And there is a key word there at the end, which is action. So without that, we, we, we don't convert things. But with the help of action, you can convert this. So they are similar. Let's see, look at, look at the, the, this globe here. There are the longitudes there. And the longitudes are telling you the distances in the meridians. But in fact, we call them time zones, right? Now, what about the GPS? You know, the, it turns out that GPS is the way how we look at ourselves, but GPS has no meter metric whatsoever. It doesn't even have time metric. All it has, it measures interference of the signals. So this is the chronicle that we started with an abstract thing, two abstract things, and then we concretized it by, with the help of measuring instruments. And when we had those measurement instruments, we could ask a few other interesting questions, such as, where am I? Or what time is it? Or what date is it? Now, it's an interesting problem when you try to see what is the relationship between duration and the now? What is the relationship between distance and here? And it's circular because the here and now is determined by the end of something, duration or distance. But distance and duration can be determined by two points. So one can, or presumes that we know something about the other. It is a relationship that the human mind makes. This is all about relationship as uh, Neil Cohen and, and uh, Howard Eichenbaum told us the, uh, for a long time, but uh, uh, <coughs> this morning as well. So if the two are related to each other, then you can find parallels between the two. And indeed we do. When we look at position, we can say there's a time point. When we are looking at distance, you can say there is duration. And something links them together. And if it's vectorial, then we talk about displacement, and error, time, and so on. This is echoing things in, not only in, in, in philosophical thinking and humans, but also in physics. Because, because you can always ask, you know, is there any motionless universe? Can you train a rat doing nothing, just measuring the time moving by. And naively, many of us try to do that. So can, it, can it, no event happen in time? These are the, the kind of things. So uh, in the previous session, we heard about where we are heading, what is the future and, uh, of, of neuroscience. And, you know, and, and, and we, 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 we talked about how you can fix the head of the animals or how you can have uh, virtual navigation in humans. Well, you have to be careful because these are different problems. You know, one is when we talk about speed or velocity, and one is, one is, is talking about distance and displacement. So these are, in physics, the different concept. We lump them together in physics, in neuroscience, and don't care about it. So let me just recapitulate what I have said so far. So there is a relationship between space and time. In fact, even prior to Newton, people already knew that speed converts one to the other. So they are not independent. They are redundant. So these, in these old days, of course, we assume that there is space, according to Newton, it's a big container, it's a big theater, into which you can put things in. And there is a timeline onto which you can put things. And this is how the definition of, uh, of Enver Tulving was, that you put things, which is memories, into a container and on a timeline. The new world arrived with, with, with Einstein, of course, and then the, the space-time was invented. But, of course, people are stubborn, and they wanted to understand you know, what happened to time. So, this is a famous quote from, uh, from, from uh, Einstein, is that he got frustrated and said, man, if you are interested in time, just look at the clock. This is exactly what, what your time is. So, I read at least 40 books about time and space uh, written by wonderful people. They all end up with God. 
recently they end up with consciousness. But in the old days, it's, it's all about, about God. So they don't know how to grapple this, with this problem. So this seems to me that this became a question for neuroscience. Why is that? This is the declaration of the 20th century physics. There is no longer space which contains the world, and there is no time which, if, in which events occur. Things are not in the world. The world is the things themselves. So that's a big difference, and we try to, you have to understand it. It seems that our neuroscience is still in the Newtonian physics situation. So we have to move forward. So where are we now? So these are the elements of navigation in this room. Everybody knows what, it, what, the, what these mean. This is, this is the met metaphor of our navigation. But everybody knows that the, just is, you know, the map is just a map. It's a set of positions. Uh, you know, there is no time involved, no action is involved, and so on. If you understand, if you try to understand what navigation is about, you have to move, just like in physics. You know, motion is, is an absolute thing, in, absolutely needed. There, without motion, you never understand either time or space. So navigation is action. Once you start navigating, then you have to think about other terms, such as duration, velocity, measuring instruments, and so on. And most of us didn't. There are exceptions, such as McNaughton's group. This is a, one of my favorite uh, papers. Many of you, if you haven't read it, please read it. This is where action came into the picture, because the, uh, his group, uh, Bruce and Carol Barnes' group, realized that this is very important. It's about other things, such as uh, not only the static space. So now we have uh, exploration. Exploration will lead to making a map. So this is exactly the, the cartoon you can have in your mind, that in order to have a map, you have to explore the world. So what is, the, what is a map that is needed? So I can go back a little bit here. I said, well, when you come and visit New York City, you want to find my lab, and uh, you take the subway, you emerge from the subway with a map in your hand, you need a couple of things to do. The first thing is that you have to rotate the map, so the orientation of the map will be correct. The second thing is that you have to relate the environment where they are, and there's, this is the, the grid system that you can have the x, y coordinates on the map. The third one is to have to locate yourself, and then you have uh, your localization, the, the place cells, or the hippocampal system. The fourth thing that you need, we don't know much about it, because this is the scale of the map. You have to figure out whether the scale of the map relates to five-minute walk or a five-hour cab drive because then your decision is affected by that. There are not good candidates at the moment about how you scale the map. So luckily, it's not only on the left side of the, the, the picture that has two components, but the right side also. Our memories are those memories that we can declare consciously, come into two flavors. One is, is the egocentric memory, and the other one is what you can call things, the names of things and so on, that is explicit knowledge. Now, to make a long story short, you can make an assumption is that initially nature worked out a mechanism to use the external world to help a simple nervous system to move, allow the movement around and find places in the world. But with time, the system got smarter and smarter and then it could internalize this outside world and you no longer have to move with your muscles, but you can still move back and forth into the future or into the past, and this is what we call mental navigation. Now, mental navigation is also something only you can do yourself. Nobody else can get into your brain. On the other hand, if you do it many times, or many people do, and then you communicate your, your knowledge about something, then the different things will overlap, and you can strip off the spatial temporal conditions of those things, and it becomes an expert information. Let me give you an example. If you discover something in a lab, that's an experience. You are entitled to have one, maybe two discoveries in your life. So you will never forget it. <laughs> but if that discovery will be confirmed by another lab, another lab, another lab, sooner or later it becomes a fact. Nobody cares who discovered it. Nobody cares you know, what, what the circumstances were. 
it just became a semantic knowledge. So the claim is that indeed there is a relationship. The hippocampus doesn't really calculate space or memory. It just does one kind of computation that we happen to call for historical reason by one name or the other name. So what this right side, your right side, requires is that now instead of driving the brain in a Newtonian mechanical way, it has to have a self-organized mechanism that allows that one assembly can drive the next assembly, and the next assembly can drive the next assembly, and so on. So I can give this talk without any external cues. So the, the issue here is what is change? How is change brought about in the brain? In case of the hippocampus, you can say that the reason why place cell one, place cell two, place cell five is, comes after one or the other because the animal is moving around the world and the sensory cues are changing. There's another way of thinking about this, which is there is a self-organized system. In fact, the hippocampus and many of the parts of the brain just can't help. All they do is generate sequences, sequence after sequence after sequence. And so if that is the case, then of course it is a candidate uh, substrate for anything called cognition, but it's a candidate, candidate substrate also for episodic memory. So you have seen this many times, just a repetition. Indeed, the discoveries are of, of, of the place fields and trace possession are, you know, this is 30 years of fantastic work by the best people in this, in this field. It just shows you without sound for some reason. Okay, there is sound. So the, the, there are place cells and, and there is uh, in the background, this was uh, 1971 and many years later, time came into the picture. Camouflage as hippocampal data oscillation. And then there was a a wonderful thing, and Ono Keefe said, oh, this is a further proof that you don't have to wait for the entire integration time. All you have to do is take a snapshot of the theta cycle, and you have a good idea where the animal is, because there is an exquisite relationship between the spike timing relative to the theta cycle of the neuron and where the animal is. If you, so this is positioning, okay, where you are. Now let, let's see how two neurons behave. Now, when, when you look at two neurons, what you can do is measure the distance outside in the world with a ruler. So you, you're measuring against an instrument that you have outside in the world. And then you can ask, how is this distance is related to duration? Now the duration can be measured as the time offset between the two neurons. And what the blue thing there is that the, the moving rat on a, on a track, and the leg, length of the blueness means how fast the animal runs. And you can see sometimes it runs faster, sometimes it runs slower, but the interesting part of it is that the distance, the 80 centimeter, is relatively fixed, and on the right side you can see that the timing is not moving with speed. The timing is fixed. So now we have an interesting problem, is that the timing is fixed, the play cell distances are fixed, so something has to happen in order to get a good relationship, and the something in between, of course, is speed. So let's zoom in and see what happens when you ex explicitly look at the effect of speed. So here are two trials of the same neuron. Once the animal is running twice as fast, so in the slow run, there are about 10 theta cycles. In the fast run, there are only five cycles. If you look at the count the number of action potentials that represent, sorry to say this word, the, the place field, that the numbers are pretty much the same. In fact, if you look at the different trials at different running speeds, the number of action potentials actually don't change very much. So if they don't change, that means that in the case when you have only five theta cycles, then you've got twice as, twice as many action potentials per theta cycle which means it's stronger depolarization, which means the phase possession in time that is from cycle to cycle gets stronger in, 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 in this world. So then you can see that indeed, when the animal is running faster, its oscillation frequency changes. Now it's good news because now you have time. When you have time and speed at the same time, you can calculate the distance. And this is the reason perhaps, or the internal explained reason, reason why the, this, the, the relationship between phase of the spike and the distance elapsed from the beginning of the placeful remains put. Because speed 
is helping you out with timing, which is internally generated. So let's move one step further. Said, well, what would happen in a situation if you would freeze the animal here and now? According to the good theory, the O'Keefe theory, then there should be always a subset of neurons that will fire forever, determining the XY coordinate of the Cartesian system. And if you remember the phase precession story, then those neurons that happen to fire, a small fraction, they should fire at the same phase forever. And so we did an experiment that, that tested it with Deva Pashtakova, where we trained animals to run in a wheel in a hippocampus dependent task, where in between the trials, the animal was asked to run in the, facing the same direction and running at about the same speed. So we have done everything possible to make sure that the vestibular cues, the, the optic flow, and everything in the environment and from the body is relatively constant. And what we found is that, of course, not of course, but we didn't find any neuron that would be firing throughout the time and saying, you are here, you are here, you are here. Instead, we find this evolving, sequentially changing patterns. Some neurons like to, to fire at the beginning of the trial, some in the middle, and if you have enough, then the entire journey is styled by some neurons. But the interesting part of this, of course, is that in that trajectory, there is information about memory. Not about the, only memory. In, in memory allows you also to make predictions. So you can read out from this trajectory where the animal is going to the right or going to the left. So I'm, I'm showing an example. This is what we already heard this morning. That is the, the discovery by Emma, Emma Wood and, uh, and Howard Eichenbaum. That in the sound, to left and right, and again, the sound is not doing what it should. But take my word, there are cells that fire preferentially when the animal will make a right turn and when the animal will make a left turn. And if we have enough number of neurons, what you see here is every line is the firing rate of a single neuron, and the columns are, there are many, many lines here, there are different neurons, and these are the same neuron identities on the two panels, selected into two groups, depending on whether they went to the right or went to the left. And what you can see is that you can take a slice of time anytime you want, and you can predict whether the animal will go to the right or left, 20 seconds, sometimes uh, 15, 20 seconds ahead, including errors with 90% accuracy if you have enough number of neurons. Now, this is, this is okay, but the reason why I brought this in is now it's an interesting situation. With the same exact trajectory, you can get three types of information. One is that you can say which direction the animal is going. That's the what. You can also calculate how long the animal, the how, how distant, what is the distance the animal travels? Because from the trajectory, you can always say, what is the distance you travel, as well as the duration of the travel. So in just one trajectory, you can get the three types of information that we were looking for, three different coding systems, time, distance, and, and uh, the, the, the what situation. So this is what ignited or motivated uh, how would I come out to say, aha, uh -huh, if there are play cells, let me tease the community and say, play cells are in fact time cells. And he is right, but it doesn't mean that anybody else is wrong, because time and space are probably or meaning they're pretty much the same. In fact, here's a good example. This is a, this is a, this is a nice uh, time cell, if you want. And then we, when you look at the distances, that are associated with, they are different, radically different. But if you look at the three different groups, you can see, yeah, in one case the animal was slow, the other times it was faster. So when you have speed and you have good speed resolution, time and I mean, distance and duration are perfectly equivalent. There may be a difference how different types of neurons in the hippocampus are sensitive to the vestibular input or neck muscle input or optic flow or something that tells you something about the, 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 the speed or velocity of running. So now we have distance, we have duration, and we have theta cycle. 
And the interesting thing, of course, the theta is intrinsic. You can call it a timer, but in fact, there is no good reason because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cyclic thing. But let's see how the three different things relate to the place fields. There are six place cells here, color-coded, and you can make it out a little bit that the black one has mostly firing at the beginning and the red one at the, at the end, and, and they have place fields. But the place fields from trial to trial they shift a little bit, and they are lousy related to when you look at the, 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 the trial to trial relationship. And this is organized by distance. You can organize it also by how much time elapsed from the beginning of the trial, and then this is pretty bad also. But if you look at the, what happens within the theta cycle, cycle by cycle, you can see it by eye that it's a different world. So you can say, oh, the internal timer, sorry to use the word timer, is, uh, is indeed a different thing because it, it brings together things in an organized way. But neurons in the brain have no clue what's happening in the outside world, at least not by, at the time, every single data cycle. So now the interesting thing, is, of course, is that we've got a theory, we've got a fantastic map, a cognitive map, but it's an abstract map. The important thing to know is how is this map translated into action? And that's the key thing, because without knowing how downstream neurons, downstream classifiers, downstream readers, utilize the information, that information is not information in the sense because it's only for you means something, nothing to the brain. So if you are interested how to do that, I suggest that you look at the David Tingley's poster and see what happens in the lateral septum that is reading out the hippocampal map it's tomorrow. So now, Let's go back to my favorite list. And he said, aha, there is a long list here. Everything is negotiable. We don't know where the consciousness is such the way it is. We don't know where the sensation, emotion, attentions are. These are all man-made or human-made ideas. And maybe perception of time and perception of space is pretty much the same thing. Now, you can see that it's called perception of time. The problem with it is that we don't have sensors to perceive either time or space. So from first principles, there is no way to understand space from the outside in approach, but from by the, by the, 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 uh, the, the empiricist way. So there is a further problem, of course. It's not only that the brain does not perceive space or time. It cannot make space or time either. Right? So, there is, I mentioned it already, I mentioned it already. On the other hand, we do have sensors for certain things. You know, velocity can be measured. We have head direction and we have a, a, a speed information. So that's a, 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 a first principle that we can use. And now we have a very interesting situation because what we do, is I already explained to you, that we measure a relationship between what, what's happening in the world, what happens in the brain, and that is information, the relationship is, is available for the experimenter, and the experimenter quantifies these observations against an instrument or instruments that were made by other humans. So the human is a double agent because it is also trying to understand the to be explained, and those things that explain. It's called the explanance and the explanandum in Aristotelian logic. And we mix them up. So how we can do a little bit better? We have to be careful about how we translate our observations. Because if you mix up the explanance and the explanandum, this is what you may get, namely, even if in your observation you can see a very nice temporal sequence of something, it doesn't mean that is the same thing as the representation of a sequence, which would be time. I hope that at least some of you in the audience understood this. So now at least we can revisit the initial problem and said, what is episodic memory? What is the right definition? And of course, I don't have a right definition, but I have something. So we have to take out space and time from here, 
and then we can say, well, here is my substitute, which is a sequence. There are sequences in the brain. The brain just can't help it. Just sequential order. So sequential order multiplied with the, with the what? It gives you something like this. So episodic memory is an order sequence of a translation in the Indian what? So it is like a little bit in, in, in Buddhist philosophy is that the, the world is nothing else but a series of nows. You are always in the now. So in, this morning I've, I've said, uh, Neil showed a nice quote from, uh, from uh, Tennessee Williams. It was the other way around. It said, the now is so small, so short, you know, we can never notice it. It's only the past and the future. Well, Buddhist philosophy is just the other way around. So I have to tell you some, one more thing, which is very important, and this is it. So when we study the hippocampus in the rat, and uh, Manovita is looking at this figure very carefully because uh, he contributed <laughs> many parts up to this, said, oh, it does matter where you are recording from because the hippocampus is just a sausage. It's just an appendage to the large neocortex. What it does is bidirectionally communicates with the large neocortex, and it represents whatever it represents, happens in the neocortex. But what happens in the neocortex in a rodent is quite different than in a larger brain. So there are colors here. You can see this is the ventral quadrant of the hippocampus, which is tiny, tiny. This is what is connected to the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and so on. And this gets huge. This becomes the uncus and the body of the primate hippocampus because the neocortex is no longer only about uh, motor and sensory function, but there is a large nonalite territory, which is, by the way, called association cortex because of the British empiricist. You know, the, the term comes from uh, this historical roots. So now it's an interesting thing because they, the, the, wherever people put an electrode, this is one thing, but they also, it's a very important thing, is that how we set up a situation, how we set up the experiment. If we set up to get an answer about space, we got a space answer. If you set it about time, we get another one and another one. If it's about varying tones, then it will be varying tones. And, and in other words, the hippocampus is completely blind to modalities. It doesn't know what information is coming in. All it knows is that something came in, I have to report back, and it uses probably the same exact algorithm. Doesn't. So what is the generic function of the hippocampus then, if it's not about any of these things? So the generic function would be something that is universal. The hippocampus does it all the time, and this may be it, which is succession of events. So you can say from the bottom up or inside out way that let's see what the hippocampal mechanisms are and then give names to it. So the hippocampus is a general purpose generator that, that can encode something, maybe the content limited ordinal structure that ties the gap between things and events and so on. And this is, of course, exactly what episodic memory is about. So you can also say it in a, in a different way that the episodic memory is a succession of events, it's general and so on, but it's not perfectly my idea. You can find nice papers in the literature, such as from Davachi's lab. It's a wonderful thing about uh, sequences. Uh, Larry Squire, Maguire, or Maguire has this wonderful uh, uh, story about the, the amnesic uh, uh, taxi driver that can do a lot of things except generate sequences. It cannot put the right order to get home or from one place to another. And uh, Lina dallan Foskovic, and also, of course, uh, uh, Heike, Howard Eichenbaum, who talked about sequences. So to end, the story said, well, what would happen if you take out space and time from the equation. How we describe the hippocampus and how we describe the hippocampus, its relationship with the rest of the world or rest of the brain or especially the neocortex. So here's a metaphor, which is the hippocampus is a librarian. It generates sequences, but it's, the sequences are very helpful because the sequences are pointers to the what's. And the what's are in the books in the neocortex. But of course, the search in a library is a library is only as good as its searchability. You need something to be searched very quickly, and that's what the hippocampus would be very helpful because it would point exactly where the, the books are, where things are important. And 
we are back at least 40 years or 30 years in time <laughs> to Tyler and Dishana, whose uh, is, is indexing theory or indexing uh, hypothesis is probably very much relevant to what we are talking about today. So I'd like to leave you with this uh, uh, claim without much support that the, we can understand the brain as an independent variable and we start classifying the words that are made up by humans and modify them just like it has been done in computer science, genetics, and in every other science that exists, physics, except neuroscience. Thank you very much.